All right, to get started, I've watched a whole bunch of presenters stand behind this, and it's been giving me anxiety. So I'm going to grab the mic. Hello. And I'm going to walk over here. Because I feel that this side of the room has not gotten on much love. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's give this room, side of the room some love. So the title of my talk is Back in the Day. And the quick history behind this is uh, Carrie said, what are you going to talk about? And I think I sent her back a four-word email that said, back in the day. Trust me, it'll be great. <laughs> um, and, the, and, the best, and the reason why I do that is because um, between now and when I first talked about that, come on in, come on in, come on in. Um, when, I first talk, when we first talked about this, uh, I probably have given about six or seven talks between then, and I really just had no idea what I was going to talk about. So I just said back in my day, it could be a whole bunch of things. It could be like a Jeff Foxworthy, are you? So um, it could be like a redneck convention for the next 40 minutes. But I promise you, <laughs> promise you, this will not be what I'm talking about. So. Uh, the first, I want to start with the disclaimers. I felt that disclaimers are kind of a thing here. Um, there are no motions in my slides. Um, if, you're a, if, if slides bother you, there might be a problem. But, um, um, but I also want to talk about other things. I want to talk about my privilege. Um, I, am an, I am a developer. Um, I have a great job where people pay me to, do, to write software. Um, I realize that that's a privilege. I live in a great house. I have a great family. I have a really good job, and I just have a really good life. And I want to say I'm really thankful for where that is. And I hope to be able to encourage other people to do some of the things that I've done in life so they can share in this privilege with me. And just remember that there are, we are not um, denigrating or talking down in this talk at all. This is really a positive talk. Um, and the reason this comes from is that there's been a lot of heavy talks here, and I love heavy talks, but um, I'm not going to say I'm a crier. I mean, I tear up every once in a while. I'm not a crier, but I feel that the, the crowd really needs, you know, a little bit of a pump, pump me up. So I'm going to give that to you. So um, my name is Brian Lyles. Uh, like I said, um, I'm, a, I'm a software engineer, kind of, at DigitalOcean. I was in software engineering, and now I'm not. I just do things. But they all end up being writing software. So I guess I still am a software engineer at DigitalOcean. Um, my employer paid for me to be here. They paid for my whole trip. I'm on a ending a 10-day trip, so I'm really thankful. Um, and a little blurb is that we do cloud stuff. If you want to talk about it afterwards, I will be happy to talk about it. <laughs> so, um, actually, I have a big favor. Whoever's sitting in the front row right now, haha. <laughs> guess what you're getting ready to do. Um, <laughs> It's not often that the presenter will ask you to take a picture with their camera of them on stage. So could you do this for me? I just think this will be a great picture. <laughs> so um, like, like this. You're in a shadow. Oh, I'm in a shadow? Uh, more like, I don't want to do like that, but um, like this. Forward. This way. All right. All right. I, you know, I have a 64 gig. I think it'll fit. <laughs> so now to the real thing. Um, warnings. Like I said, I am not here to offend. I, I am not here to make anyone feel bad. And I am not here to make any friends. So if any time during the talk, if you do not like something I say, you, have, you need any clarity, raise your hand. I most likely will call on you. And we can, you can just shout things at me, and I want this to be a dialogue. More of me talking than you talking, but I do want this to be a dialogue. <laughs> so, into the talk. So back in my day, where am I coming from for this? Well, uh, this year is actually a very good year. This year I can truly say that I have been writing software for money, not as a hobby, for 20 years. Um, I, I am, actually, I can say that I have been doing this for literally most of my life. This is, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I'm going to, this is my little impact on the world. So I want to talk about back in my day. So it's not this back in my day. Anybody familiar with this, this CD? Or actually, it wasn't a CD at the time. It was a tape <laughs> and a record. Um, there, was a, there, was an, there was a artist out of LA called Ahmad, and he had this great song called Back in My Day, and I've been listening to it all day. I wish a sound would have showed up. Actually, let's see if the sound comes up. 
No. So, um, I'm, so what I'm going to do is the song goes, it goes back in my day, back in the day when I was young, I'm not a kid anymore, but some days I really wish I was a kid again. And this is what my talk is about. So, so let's talk about that. So the first one I want to bring up is back in my day, we learned languages. Uh, we learned all the languages. It wasn't just one, because when I started writing software, I started with C, because you know what? That's the only thing I knew. I didn't know there was any other easier languages. And this would have been back in the late 80s, very early, actually late 80s, very early 90s. I learned C. I thought software development was C. And then I took it a step further, and I said, well, the C thing is amazing. Why don't I go learn assembler? I think I went the wrong way. So I wrote assembler, <laughs> I wrote assembler and I said, this software thing is amazing. I love this. And then I found about Pascal, and it's like, oh, languages, there are languages out there that actually want the user or the developer to be able to be productive. And what I, <laughs> so um, the point that I'm trying to make here is that whenever I go to these conferences, and I know there's a, quite a division, I've met plenty of you at other conferences, and so who here is, would say, I'm a JavaScripter? Is that what you call yourself, JavaScripters? <laughs> JavaScriptist, JavaScripting? Then there's other Rubyists here. Yeah, I know there's some Rubyists here. Are there any um, gophers here? Anyone here write Go? I write Go. I'm a gopher. Um, anyone here write anything like Rust or Erlang or Elixir? So the problem we have now is that, is that people, when we, when we start talking about writing software, people are just saying that I do this one language and not thinking that, hey, you know what? Software development is a huge world. There are so many languages, good and bad, that we can use. And what, we, what I find in this new age, and this is not a negative, do not tweet this as a negative, we have these, we have these schools, and I, and, I, and I appreciate each and every one, and I know there's Ada here, there's, there's a few more around the, and there's like some in, there's like Dev Boot Camp in Chicago and other places, and there's Flatiron School, and I know people here who have gone through those. And I'm not saying it's a negative, but what I'm really wishing is that we realize that software development is not making web pages. Software development is actually writing embedded systems for cars, and hopefully you're doing the right job and not lying on your emissions test. And I will say that um, I actually drive a Volkswagen, um, I hope, that they don't go out of business because I actually like my Volkswagen. But um, there are other things. So, you know, we can write things for cars and airplanes and all these autonomous vehicles coming up. That is software development. And I'm really wishing that these schools would say that we're not just training you to make web pages and other things. We need to train these, we need to train a new generation of software developers to do other things. There's so much things that we can do with the software. So, um, back in my day, um, we didn't call it open source. I can remember when the term open source actually became a thing. I can't, don't ask me today, but I do remember. Uh, what we did is we wrote software and we took the source code and we uploaded it to these things called BBSs. <laughs> and I don't care if it was like a FidoNet board or some other type of board, where you took the software and you uploaded it and you shared it with people and then they would share their things with you. We didn't know that was called open source, we just did it. And the reason why is because we didn't really have, this is, this is actually pre-Brian internet. Um, I had to get on, the way that I got on the internet at first was it was all text. Like I didn't even know what a browser, I knew what a browser was, I didn't have a computer fast enough to run it for quite a while. So we shared things. So open source, whenever I started, was just developers doing what developers do best. We share, we love to share. Look at all these developers. Most people here would call themselves developer-like, developer, you know, developer-ish. You might not write code for a living, but you might have ambitions to, even, even as a secondary thing. Uh, but even now, we want to come here, we're coming here today and we shared all these feelings about, more, more feelings in open source, but we, we, we are a sharing community. And back then, we've always been a sharing community, so we didn't even have anything called open source. Just find it weird, you kids. <laughs> okay, back in the day, we didn't have, we wrote our dynamic web apps with CGI and Java applets. Um, this will be the first one to say that, hey, uh, May Culpa, we screwed up. Um, <laughs> this was never, never a good idea. If you think about it, you had, you had your Apache, or HTTPD, I'm showing my age, and what it would do 
is it would exec a program and you would send things to this other program and it would send things back. You know, I don't know why we got rid of that. Nothing bad could happen with that kind of thing. Um, but today, you know, and this is one of the bonuses of living in this mysterious thing called the future is that now we have full web, we have full scale web applications for better or worse running in your browser. And for some of us it's better. For us that have like little Macs or little PCs, it's, it, it might not be better. But the technology has not stagnated in the web. And the thing that I, and what I wanted to bring up is that even in 2015, we have only scratched the surface of what web is. And think about it, this, the debate, there's still a debate about um, is, should I make mobile apps or should I write like Android or iOS or Microsoft apps? You know, and, and depending on who you talk to, they'll definitively tell you an answer, but they'll be, definitively be wrong because we don't know. And it's a crazy thing. This is actually a great place. And I want to say that I was talking kind of weird about web developers before, but now I'm going to give you all the positives. People in this room, or people watching this video, if they ever choose to watch it, you actually can set this forward. Um, think about it. Um, before Node came along, um, who thought that we would be running uh, JavaScript on this server? Matter of fact, if I would have sat down with you in like 2010 or 2009 and said, hey, 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 hold on, you're going to love this. <laughs> You know that language, JavaScript, that we use in the browser? You'd be like, that one? I'm like, yeah, that one. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing if we took it out of the browser and onto our desktop or into our servers and actually wrote software with it? You would not be like, whoa, no, that'd be crazy. You'd be like, no, Brian, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but what we've proved in the years that Node has been out, that you know what? Um, whether you do or do not like callbacks and, that, um, and how Node does it, Node is a very viable, although slower than Go, way of writing web apps. <laughs> so that's good. I mean, this is good. So back in my day, things were kind of weird, kind of crappy. Uh, but now they are you know, less weird, but extremely less crappy. And hopefully the word crappy does not offend anyone. We can talk about that later. All right. Um, who here is like, I hate the word DevOps, even though I go to DevOps conferences and talk about DevOps things, but you know, there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of development and a whole bunch of work that takes place behind the scenes to making our computers big, fast, and powerful. So who here, so I'll read this. I'll say back in the day, um, CI, continuous integration, um, CD, continuous deployment, clustering of your disk, servers, and services management were actually hard. And not I have to search Google hard problems. So let me, let me dig into this. At one time, believe it or not, and, and this is going to be the craziest thing you've heard today, hopefully it does not make you sad because it's a positive talk, is that there was no such thing as Google. <laughs> and um, you could not go, I mean, you could go, so you could go to AltaVista or go to Yahoo, but even before AltaVista, Yahoo, um, there, was not, there was no easy way for us to go to the internet and be able to search for arbitrary things. We couldn't go in there and type Obama is in Google and see what happens. Actually, you should do it, it's pretty funny. Um, we could not do that. But now, we can do these kinds of things. And just the, just the thought that now, like I, I asked someone to take a picture of my phone. Imagine, that phone right there, that's a brand new iPhone 6S Plus 3.0 or something. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the newest phone that came out from Apple just, a, just last week. Um, that little thing is more powerful than the computer that you had on your desktop less than 10 years ago. Think about that. Um, that is crazy. We have actually, you know, collectively moved progress from way over here to way over here. And it's not even slowing down, it's actually going faster. So back in my day, life kind of sucked. I'm actually surprised we could flush the toilets and the stuff went somewhere. <laughs> now think about that. Now, you know, you flush it and you look down there and you're like, hey, but you know it's not coming back. When I was growing up, we did not know that. And I'm not that old. I am not quite 40 yet. Whew. So, so um, back in my day, there was this thing called Byte. Anybody here remember Byte Magazine? Am I showing my age? Byte Magazine? Yeah. What did you do with Byte Magazine? You, Byte Magazine was great. They would, you would actually go to the store or come in the mail and it had source code on dead paper. And you would go to your computer and you would type all that source code in. And, and what would you do? You would run it and then what would happen? It didn't work. It never worked. 
and then you'd have to figure it out, and, and you, you had to figure it out. There was no going off to, I mean, you could actually, actually at this time, news groups did exist, so you could actually probably go to a news group, but there was no easy way to figure this out. So what did we have to do? We had to become more resourceful. It actually made us better developers because we understood our source from first principles, from the fundamentals, and the thing that I'm finding now is that we have developers and once again, I'm getting ready to say something that might be derogatory. It's not derogatory. We have this concept called a full stack developer. And the problem with the full stack developers is their stack is this tall when the actual stack goes down to the floor. So, um, and it's not a bad thing. I think everyone needs to start somewhere. And I, and I would never say that, hey, you're, you're a dummy and you're only doing web programming because that would be an awful thing. And I don't say awful things all the time. So. Um, but what I'm saying is that it forced you, at, at growing up in a time that I did, it forced you to understand that, hey, I had to actually go load program eight comma n comma i, and you're like, or, and you're like what does that even do? You actually had to do that. I actually had programs, I had this Tandy Color Computer 3, and all the programs are stored on tape. So me and all my genius, I said, well, I wanna hear what my, my applications sound like. So I took that tape, and I put it in my father's tape, and I played it. And guess what it sounded like? Shh. But that was, and but that actually made me curious about what was going on. So that forced me to think about, well, what is this sound doing? It's basically, it's basically binary played over an audio. So what does that mean? So right now, because we have all these things like Google and these conferences and papers we love and all these other neat things telling us all this high-level stuff. We actually have lost the ambition, or some of this, have lost the ambition to go look under the covers and see exactly how, how the sausage is made. And I'll tell you what, um, sometimes the sausage, uh, if you really want to know how the sausage is made, it's really gross, but we're actually in the place now where things aren't as bad as we think they are. Actually, a lot of things, a lot of systems that we've seen built from the ground up, even building compilers, I could sit down here with anyone in this room, and in a week, I could actually show you the fundamentals of writing a compiler. It's not that hard. But if I did, I would actually charge you a lot of money because, you know, I have to eat as well. But what I'm saying, it's not that hard. We can definitely do these things. So moving on, like I said, this is a light talk. I'm here to make you happy. I'm not here to make you sad. Wait till the end, though. Um, back in my day, you were, stuck in, you were stuck in the console if you foobarred your xconfig. First of all, any, everyone here knows what foobarred mean, right? I want to be inclusion. If you don't know what foobarred, raise your hand. Okay, right in the back. It actually means effed up beyond all repair. Fubard, makes more sense. So basically, so I actually started off with, win, with, with DOS, not Windows, because I didn't have a computer fast enough to run Windows, and then I was one of those kids who took the 31 disk download of Linux, because it took 31 disks to download Linux, and I said 31 floppy disk. And then you would, it would take you about a week to download it, and then what you would do <laughs> is you would install it, disk, by disk, and it would take you another week to get that installed. And then your mom would come in and just like turn it off and be like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> so then you'd have to start over again. And then by the time you got it on, you wanted to see this whole crazy thing called X. And basically X is, you know, it's a graphical user interface and that Linux was using. Um, and then you, so what you would do is you have this configuration. And inside this configuration was a description of the mode lines for your CRT. And really what that was, so we used before these LCD things, we used things that look like old school televisions. This is a history lesson for, these, for us youngins. And what it did, it was like a TV, but it was connected to your computer. And, um, and what you would do is it would describe basically how the, it would describe the vertical settings for it. But if you use the wrong settings, there was literally a disclaimer, and I've never done this, but I found someone on Twitter who's done this, um, if you change the settings too far away, you would actually blow up your hardware with software. You can't even do this. I don't even know if you can even do this anymore. You can't do it with an LCD because they only operate at, the, at, at one frequency. But you could actually physically blow up your mother's TV because actually with my Color Computer 3 and then other ones, you could actually blow that up with software. And then what were you doing? You were stuck at your, ex -con your, your console. So I actually did screw up my X configuration a whole bunch of times, so it forced me to do one thing very important, learn how to use the shell. And this wasn't bash, these are pre-bash days. So at this time, the hot shell was corn shell. And you know, I was all about my corn shell. So that's KSH. You might even have it, if you, 
You might not have it installed, but you can install it. And what it forced me to do was learn exactly how it, uses, how it works. How does the terminal settings work? How can I navigate through my, my, um, my actual um, prompt? Do you guys know about, um, so, not guys, see, I, I hate to say this. Do you people, that's even worse. Do you all, I'm not Southern. Um, <laughs> let's see, yens, does that yens work? <laughs> See, no, Pittsburgh, I'm gonna go Pittsburgh on this one. So, do yins know uh, how to navigate through your current line without using the arrows? I'm, I'm sure most of us, right? Do you guys even know, do you yins even know um, that this is even possible? So that's the thing, I had to learn these things and now, even, now when I sit down at a shell, I just move through it and, and it's not even a thing to me. I don't have to think about it. And the lesson here is that I think we should get to the point where we are so good with our technology where we're not thinking about it anymore. Moving on, and this is a pet peeve of mine. Um, <laughs> back in the day, we had hip hop. And, and things, and, and I know we focus on, I'm not, not gonna focus on the music particularly, but I'm gonna focus on the concept of hip hop. Do you, do, do, does anyone here know what hip hop is? <laughs> oh, see, you're laughing. But hip hop is not one thing. It's how many things? You can yell it out. Four. four. It's four, that's right. And I'm gonna talk about rap, because there is a big problem with rap. Um, Tupac had a lyric in um, one of his songs, and he was talking about Marvin Gaye, and the lyric went, I remember Marvin Gaye, he used to sing to me. He had me feeling like black was a thing to me, a thing to be. And I'm like, yeah, black power, that's amazing. I wanna just go out and march in the streets. And the other day, I was listening to the music, on the radio, and there's this current artist called Future. I know you guys hate him here, sorry, once again. You hate him here because his ex something is Sierra who's dating your football guys. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't trying to, you know, I might have to pay money if I say his name, so I wasn't trying to say his name. But, um, but yeah, but he had this song, and, he was, and it basically went like 5,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 100,000, 100,000, I'm like, wow, this is like ABCs, but rap. <laughs> and, and, and I know I'm getting old, and I'm like, oh, you kids and your silly music, but guess what? If you wanna hear good music, you have to go back to the 90s and the 80s. I'm, I'm sorry. And you know, I'm on the stage, so I can say that. <laughs> so, um, moving on, I have a point here, trust me. Um, back in the day, work is hard. And the cool thing is that we had hard work to do back in the 80s and the 90s of building up a lot of the things that became what we are today. I used to work for the guy who created something called BGP. Literally, I worked with the guy. He sat right next to me. He created something called BGP. Does anyone here know what BGP is? BGP is the routing protocol that pretty much runs the whole internet. And this guy, white-haired, kind of dorky guy, but very, very nice, created that, wrote a whole RFC about it and everything. His name was Phil Gross. Uh, so we solve hard problems, but now, even in, in 2015, we're still solving hard problems. I work for a cloud company and a smaller cloud company at that, so we don't even have all the resources to solve all the problems, but we still have a team of 40 engineers who are working so hard to solve problems to help engineers like yourself and artists like yourself get on the internet at a, at a very easy price. So the thing, the point here is that it was hard, it is hard, it's always gonna be hard. And that's good because when it's hard, we know it's worthy. And when it's worthy, we know that there's salaries behind it. And I'm all about people getting paid and not because I want people to be rich. I don't even care about the money at that level. I want people to actually have a working wage and be able to, be, to support themselves well based on the, on the values they create for others. You realize that as a tech professional, you, you create a lot of value. Your employer might, not, your employer might talk down to you, but guess what, when they're paying you 100, 150, 200, guess what, they're really getting 150, 200, 400 out of you. So just remember that, don't go into your office on Monday and ask for a raise and say, Brian said so. And if you do get it, send me a check. But um, just be careful with that. So moving on, um, back in the day we didn't have save games. I actually put this on Twitter the other day and I was just thinking, I was playing Zelda, I got it for my DS, and I was thinking, oh, when, when you died back in Mario, and you were on level seven, guess what? You died. And what did you do when you died? You got mad, you turned it off, and you went outside. 
And I said even in my tweet, even in the wintertime, we went outside. Kids do not play outside today. I have children and they do not play, well, my youngest one does, but my older child does not play outside and I'm wondering why. And I'm looking down the street, it's because nobody else is playing outside. We need to get to the point where, hey, we do computers for a living, that's great, that's fine, but there's more than computers. Do computers for eight hours, and then whenever you die or you end that day, move on, go do something else. Please have a life outside of computers, unless your life is computers, and then you need to worry about having a life outside of computers. Because I know there's burnout talks, and I, I can give you a burnout talk. Please do not burn out. All right, moving on. Back in my day, but not really my day, it's more my parents' day, we had affirmative action. And how does the room feel about affirmative action, just in general? Eh. I'm gonna say one thing as a black male. Um, affirmative action works, but it's actually the crappiest thing in the world, and I'll tell you why. Because what it does is it takes someone who looks like me, puts him in a place where he may or may not be a good fit, and then society is told to deal with it. But the good thing is that this person now has a chance to succeed, so it's good for that one person. But the problem is, is that society is not ready for affirmative action. And I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, I'm saying it's one of those misblessing things. So guess what, we still have it. And I don't know how I feel about it, but I want to say it in person, because I, I really feel that it's so important, but it sucks. It's kind of like, um, it's like medicine. It doesn't taste good, but it's good for us. So we gotta continue doing it. Um, back in my day, we had Jim Crow laws, but not really, but my parents, and my grandparents, and their parents. So I do want to share this with you, and this is kind of the downer part of the talk. Uh, when did slavery end? Does anyone know? Not yet. 18, no, slavery in the United States ended in 1865. That's a fact. Uh, but the problem is, is that the slaves were free, but not really free to work or make any money or live anywhere. So um, we had the start of Jim Crow after Reconstruction. So what happens is, and my, my, my grandmother died a few years ago, but her brother is still alive, and he tells, he tells a better story than I do, of in the 1920s or, or in early 1930s that their, his parents, were, so my great-grandparents were sharecroppers, which was literally just basically, you're not, we can't call you slaves, but you can't own the land. But you have to work on the land and you can't move anywhere else. So, and now, and that, and that happened, and then World War II came along, and that was actually a good thing because it meant that People who look like me could move off and, and we could go fight in this war, not be treated equitably, but when we came back, there was this thing called the GI Bill, which actually sounds like a great idea, except that uh, blacks could get the money, but they couldn't actually do anything with it. And do you really, and this is, this is a theory, I'm, I'm working on this theory, and it might be true, is that uh, a lot of generational wealth in whites actually came from World War II, where they got the GI Bill, they were able to buy houses and they were able to keep those houses, houses just went up in value, you sell, now your family has money. But, if you're black, and first the government wouldn't give you any money, and then, but the Supreme Court actually ruled way before that, in like 1935, that that was illegal, that the government could not discriminate. So what they did is they went to these housing communities, and they went to these neighborhood communities and said, hey, if you give any blacks, any, or can move in here, we'll remove all the funding for this neighborhood. So guess what? All the blacks had to move to these neighborhoods. And I happen to live in Maryland, not in Baltimore, but close enough. Like really, really close. And you'll notice if you look in Baltimore, all the blacks live in two places. They live on the far west side of Baltimore and they live on the far east side of Baltimore. It's not because they wanted to live there. It's because they had to live there. So when their lives are crappy and all that violence, it's not because they're violent people. They're people who just don't know what they can do with because of their lives. So they're acting out on themselves and everything around them. It's not, it's not because they're bad people, like just all of them. Some of them are bad, there's bad people everywhere. This is because they have nothing else better to do. So, wow, back in my day. Um, I'm not done. So I thought I would do um, back in my day and I was saying why I sound like a crazy old guy. What else would a crazy old guy say? Wow, <laughs> get off my lawn. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, to wind this down, because I do only have a few more minutes, let's talk about get off my lawn. And now I am gonna be the angry black guy for a second. Um, so when you go out and, you, and your explicit goal is to make things more diverse, guess what, you're not winning. As a matter of fact, you're making it worse. When I was talking about affirmative action earlier, 
And we do have a form of that in companies where companies go out and say, hey, we need more women, we need more blacks, we need more this, we need more that. That's affirmative action. We're basically saying that we are going out to look for those people to place them into positions. We're not looking for the best people. So the problem is now is we have a lot of companies in tech, a lot of big companies in tech, that are saying that we need more diversity. No, you don't. You need to stop. You need to figure out a way to hire better people. And guess what? We're going to go fix the pipeline. Guess what? The pipeline is not broken. The problem is, is that at a very young age, kids who are looking like me are told that you cannot do this. You will be a failure in life. So guess what? A lot of kids do. They believe it. I was stubborn. I refused to believe that. I have actually was told by a counselor, you will never do anything in life. But then I went, and at this time, so back in my day, the SAT only went 1,600. Um, <laughs> so I'm showing you how old I am. But I scored a 1590 on that. I had a two grade point average because I hated school. I hated the concept of school. But it allowed me to go to any school that I, that I um, wanted to go to because I had such a high SAT score. So because I was constantly told all these bad things about myself, I actually didn't even take that seriously. I actually went to the book, to the library, and opened a book because we had to do it at a time. We had no online. And I just went in the middle and I said, there, I'm going there. Indiana Institute of Technology, let's do it. So, um, but I was lucky. I'm very fortunate, I'm very privileged to have that ability, but you know what? Not all of us do. So we gotta think about other words. Matter of fact, if you think diversity, think of how can we make this more inclusive? So just get that word, rid of that word diversity unless you're talking about your clothes or something. Um, here's another thing. You do not deserve an award for making anything better. The only reason that you're making it better is because you want it to be better. If you go out and you do all these things, and you're saying, well, no one's giving me praise for getting all these women here, guess what? You don't deserve any praise, especially because you asked for it. Another thing is, um, if you want to know how to win at tech, I, I've distilled it down. This is how you win at tech. This is how I know things are so right. Hire a black woman for your development team. Because I'll tell you right now, there, so I am really, there's only, I, I can't tell you like, I know all the black guys that I've ever worked with, and I can probably put them on probably two hands. But if I want to ask you, do you work with a black person or a black male, and then I said, and I, and I went on that question five times, most people in here would say, no, I, I really haven't. But I'll tell you what, black men, we might be rare, but black women, wow. I can't tell you one time, well, I can think one time ever where I've worked with an extremely technical black woman, and it's not that she's in marketing, or anything else, and that's not disparaging her for being in marketing or anything else. I'm saying, put on, find a black woman, put on your dev team. And whenever you've done that, I know your organization is right. Um, and also, I'm not an angry black guy. I'm a passionate black guy. Do not mistake my, my passion for anger. Um, I, I find that people will say, you can clap, that's fine. I'll talk <laughs> over you. Um, I do have to worry about that. I'm six foot two. I'm, over 200 pounds, and people say, well, Brian, you're always so mad. I'm like, no, I'm upset that you are squandering this opportunity. Opportunity might come to you every day, but it doesn't come to me. So whenever I see an opportunity, I don't like to waste it. And by you wasting, it's basically saying that you do not like me, or you do not care about me. So stop. And that's where, that's where that comes from. All right, last thing, this is my last one. Um, I will say that I am not well-versed in all things going on in the world. Um, things are new and different to me. I will say that I now have more than a few transgender friends, but at one time I did not. And I will say that I made the mistake of saying transgendered. You know, that was just my ignorance, not my malice. But I want to say, if you were trying to make your point, wait for that person to finish their sentence. Don't stop them in the middle, because all you're going to do is make them take a step back and say, all right, let's fight. And not physically, but mentally. Or, or socially, they're going to say, I don't care about you anymore because you didn't even give me the opportunity to say what I was going to say, if it was wrong or right. I would rather for you to let me finish my sentence because I say things and they're not always right. But let me finish and then, Brian, and then tap me on my shoulder because I'm an adult and just say, hey, Brian, that wasn't cool or I was offended. And you know what I'm going to say? That's, you know what? That's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear because I'm not into that. So, last piece, and I know I'm running up against my time here. Actually, I know I have a couple minutes. Um, you might be a racist. Think about this. You might be a racist. I might be a racist. I don't know. I might be. But I want to I want to put this slide up here while I talk about this last story. And this is actually not my story originally, but I'm taking it and I'm running with it. 
So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to um, bring up a situation, and you can make your own decisions. So you have a development team. It's all guys, and these guys are just horrible to each other all the time. They're saying this, you know, they when it comes to code reviews, they're just nasty and they pick on each other and they and they're just nasty. Bring one black person on that team and then let one of those people who are originally on the team be nasty to them. I'm going to tell you as a black guy or and that's all I can speak as is I don't care whatever you're saying, I don't care why you were mean to me, it's because you're a racist. And it's not because you think you're not a racist, it's because you know what when I'm looking at when I'm looking at us um, only difference I see between you and me is our color, and you're being a jerk to me, it's because you're racist. And you might not think you're racist, so stop acting like one. And, and really, I, I, the way I say it is, if you don't want to be called a racist, don't be an asshole. <laughs> That's it. So, um, that, that ends my rant. Um, so what was my point? Um, I do open source. I have feelings about it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the end. <laughs> <laughs>